Hiya, how's everyone today? Good, yeah? I've actually got a few questions for you. Um, and the first one is, um, have you ever met someone who said, you know, you're a bit too intense, you know, a bit too much? Yeah, brilliant, yeah, okay, cool, yeah, me too. <laughs> I actually once met a man who I thought was a bit intense, you know, but, but I mainly regarded his hairline as opposed to his personality, so it was a bit awkward. And the thing is, I'm one of those humans that's often considered, you know, a bit too much, a bit too intense, you know, probably goes in the drawer with the challenging women because I'd rather write a book than assemble a lasagna. Yeah, not a crowd pleaser. And just, you can forget wife shaped, honestly. Because the thing is, right, a lot of my passions, my hobbies, they were just a little bit odd. They didn't really make for a smooth logistic, or they didn't really make sense. And a lot of people would fear my process because it was unpredictable. It was different. I'm autistic, by the way, and which meant that growing up in a world that isn't designed for you with people is actually really challenging. It's really challenging, actually. And I feel like it's a bit like you being Google pinned in the middle of complete, complete randomness where your senses are on fire and you, you can't really find your place. And the nuances that glue people together are just pixelated. I mean, this mic is very triggering for me right now. So, you know, <laughs> just, just saying, I just move it. It's all right. There we go. Is that right? Cool. <laughs> And so the nuances that glue people together are pixelated and the rules that everyone seems to live by are more of a service to indoctrination than they are to evolutionary programming. This isn't natural. Is this natural? I mean, people are weird, man, You're calling me weird. I don't mind you guys, you guys are fine. That's the thing, you guys are fine. And I'm not nervous at all about this, at all. And I think there's two reasons, because one, can't really see anyone, so brilliant. <laughs> and the second one is that my form of this autism allows me to speak. I can speak. That's my superpower. I can express myself. And the thing is, I can do that. But what I can't do is manage pretty much everything else in life, including cleaning my flat and managing basic logistics like groceries and toilet paper. You know, awkward. <laughs> but I can write an award-winning book whilst also doing a PhD. Yeah, I can do that. And I can live with that. So now the part of the talk that I'm not too keen on because I got to talk about myself. So brace yourself. When I was four, when I was four, actually, that was the kind of age I kind of realized everything was a bit different. And I was constantly searching in books to find a book that had a recipe on how to be, how to exist in your species, because it said something so fundamental, but something I was missing. And if there's one thing about being neurodivergent is that you often see things that others miss. Right, you feel different so acutely, like seconds within a clock. And it's a language that we all feel, but we're not taught to express. So there I was, trying to find a language to understand my place in the world and explain why things happen. And I came across science. I love science. And and I think one of the reasons why I stuck to it is because it was so universal. It was in every place, on every scale. It was a, a, a trusted process for me, where I could, in turn, trust the world would have me. Because that's another thing about being neurodivergent, right? Nothing ever feels like home. Home. Yeah. Science was my home, right? Science was not only my home, it was my guide, but it also was my first love. And yeah, it was brilliant. Talking of love, I think it's time to mention my favorite dessert, pavlova. <laughs> That's relevant, right? 
But no, genuinely though. So um, the thing is, I'm pretty greedy when it comes to science. Very greedy. I mean, that's why I'm a biochemist, because I wanted the biology, I wanted the chemistry, I wanted the physics, I wanted the maths, just all of it in one big blob. And this is it. And I thought, this is, this is my system. I'm going to build through this. And because I just was more in tune with the affinities and movements of proteins than I was with the handshakes and conversations of people. You know, they just got me. They just made more sense to me. And that was the thing. You just stick to it, don't you then? And there I was, trying to find a way, and the principles of science became my commands for living. I created my own system. And I'd like to think that the system worked, because the system, at the end of the day, wasn't based on, like, you know, words or numbers or things taught in schools, like, you know, a good little student, N not, not chair-shaped, not line-shaped. If anything, it was based on observing and feeling difference. Feeling difference. Observing different positions of an object within a pile, within like an order, literally piles upon piles that just looked like mess were all experiments in my mind that mimicked what was and what wasn't, what the and what are and what aren't and what could be. Differences, all pieces of information that just metronomed around my mind. And this was actually further fed by my uncle, uh, my uncle's science books. You know, thank you, Uncle Mike. Thank you, Uncle John. And it was by reading these and stirring these all together, I drew the parallels between the certainties of science and the uncertainties of being human. And from this, my system grew bigger, my world grew, and suddenly you can wake up in the morning and feel like it's going to be okay. You can plan your day. Maybe I can do today. And that's pretty empowering. And the thing is, when you've got your system, you get very protective over it. I didn't want to let it go. So there I was, just kind of collecting notes and bits and bobs and piles of post-its that just make no sense. And with this, I wrote the book Explaining Humans, which um, has done pretty well. And it's about um, it's a memoir-based science book that navigates humans for humans that don't understand humans, like me, but also for people who don't understand science um, to get friendly with science. And I couldn't have done this without first being called weird, and also through my infatuating love for science. So I'm a biochemist, by the way. And I might have mentioned that I like science and I love proteins. Oh, OK, cool, yeah, I have. <laughs> and the thing is, it makes me feel so bubbly inside, so reactive, so, you know, and just so out of control. And today's trigger word, ding, 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 ding. Irrational, unexpected item in bagging area. What are we going to do? And this is as if reaction is a sin. People suppress their enthusiasm because they're embarrassed. And this is why I want to highlight the importance of passion pavlovas, because we all have one, right? We all have one. And they make us go completely wild inside. We want to dance in shapes that just make no sense and just stop breathing for a second. And we're often low-key shamed for having these passions, you know, oh, gotta be realistic, oh, don't get carried away, oh, the sun's shining, but it won't be here for long. Bollocks. <laughs> Come rain or shine, I'm there. I'm there for my proteins. And that's not me being irrational or neurodiverse. That's just showing up. That is just showing up. <laughs> Thanks. Because, yeah, I get it. It's a risk to show any sign of personality that isn't described already, right? And being different, yes, it is less predictable. But that doesn't mean it is any less rational. This is OK. And this is your weird, which you jinx far more often for the sake of being safe, to look reasonable, to deserve a seat in a room. Where we all start talking like this. And that's another thing about being neurodivergent, right? You make no sense to anyone anyway. You may as well just go for it. 
you know, I've got ADHD as well. You're welcome. <laughs> and, you know, it's, you, you call it obsessive, I call it wholehearted. Passion Pavlovas, yeah, they're the start. They're the start of change in the system. And I want to highlight that my way isn't through, you know, friction or haste, not make my body go weird. They're actually through an endeavor to make peace and to spark that initial curiosity that is present in everyone to build a life that isn't yet made. Okay, second question. You're all waiting for it. I can feel it. So the second question is, why does conformity equal peace? Why does conformity equal peace? And this is a myth that we're all taught. And this is one of the reasons why I wrote Perfectly Weird, Perfectly Leeward, a book for children who are exposed to the rigidities of the education system. Where you are either good with the established symbols for communication, you know, words, numbers, or you've got special needs. You've got, you know, autism, ADHD, dyslexia, dyspraxia, dyscalculia, you know, all of these are implicitly told that they are less able because they have a different mode of perception. Really? Really? I mean, hands up, who's been told that in school they were, they were behind because they're bad with words, bad with numbers? Yeah, fair play, you know what, me too. Me too. And that was actually because I did a comprehension test where it was regarding a football going through a window, and the question was, what needed fixing? And I was like, well, you know, was the window open or closed? You know? <laughs> you know, zero marks. But why verbal? You know, why words? Why does black ink on white paper make for a secure metric for performance? Don't we realize how disabling this is for people who think differently? I mean, we are in an era where even information is within the cloud. Perhaps it's time to start updating our own views on how we measure potential. I mean, even in machine learning, we have language models that are incorporating audio-based data upon language-based data so that algorithms can capture nuances beyond the written word. I mean, if we're doing this for algorithms, then why aren't we applying the same principles of development in enabling our own kind? Hmm. All right, where does this leave us then? I mean, for starters, we can try and consider a person based on what they are and what they're trying to say and what they could be as opposed to what they should be. I mean, for example, my mum and dad raised me based on what I was and based on what I could be. And for that, I'm like forever grateful. And that didn't require a textbook, that just required faith. But a lot of teachers in schools um, found it very difficult, actually, um, because I was just weird, you know. And that was the thing, I, I, I couldn't sit still in class. I couldn't read. But the thing is, I could. I knew I could read, but to be able to be chair-shaped and line-shaped and focused in class, this is just, no. I mean, especially if the teacher smelt or wore a particularly vibrant jumper that day. I mean, <laughs> triggering. I know I do that. Definitely stimming a lot with my hair. But yeah, no, the irony was, those teachers that challenged me, can, they, they knew what they wanted to see in me, but they, but they completely missed who I was. I was an absolute laugh. And this is the thing, and, that, and, and I'm not, you know, I was badly behaved, or because I, w I was overlooked because I lived life through a different dimension to what the system was taught. Much like people with dyslexia who have incredibly spatial minds, honestly, it's, in it's amazing. And, for example, in 3D chess. I wonder if we pivoted our metric for potential, who was indeed behind. That would be interesting. So, yeah, my mum and dad... Um, like humans to their darling machines, have taken the time and the faith in making something from something that wasn't prescribed and never apologizing for it. Perhaps it's time for us to start reframing how we see potential and to see that difference is actually an unorthodox blessing and a potential to create change. Difference.
This is pretty amazing, to be honest, because it's actually the footsteps to scientific discoveries and breakthroughs. I mean, a scientific lens is, is incredible because you don't see labels or shoulds, you see what's there, observing, questioning. I'm actually writing about this at the moment, the scientific process, because I find it fascinating. And I'm asking lots of cutting edge scientists to shed light on life's biggest questions. And the more I read about it, the more I realize that it's these differences that actually make these breakthroughs that hold society up to date and make life worth living. Thinking about it, all of them are the most rational and beautiful inevitabilities in creating movements and living a life with justice. Thanks, Mum and Dad, and thank you for coming to my TED Talk.